digital spaces. And uh, I'm Stephen Wooten. I'm the director of the Food Studies Program, faculty member in the Department of Global Studies, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be involved in food studies and to bring together people on campus around food issues. And uh, the topic for today is one of the things that has been kind of part of the Food Studies Program right from the beginning issues of access and uh, issues of security and insecurity around food. It's, it was a talk uh, maybe three years ago or something like that. We had a, a talk that, that addressed issues of food insecurity uh, at our sister campus, OSU. And, and that conversation kind of clued a lot of us into uh, the needs of students and also the actions that, that uh, people at OSU were taking, people that were taking here on campus and in the community, and then nationally as well. This issue of student food insecurity and security has uh, really, I think uh, appropriately so, grabbed a lot of attention and action and building over the years. And, and today we're you know, super fortunate to have two people who are leading the, the charge on, on trying to improve the situation of access for students at the U of O. So I'm really grateful I introduced them in a second. Just wanna welcome everybody to this strange uh, food talks. Usually we have food at our talks and uh, get together before the presentation to get plates of food and hang out with each other. So this is a new experience for me is, is doing this food talk without any food and without being in physical proximity to people. So it's a, it's a strange time, but I think it's an important time to keep moving as best we can with food studies. And I think there isn't a better topic to, to start off with for our food studies uh, year and, and collaboration uh, you know, around this issue of insecurity and security. First of all, I want to introduce and thank Lisa Fink, who is the uh, GE for food studies this term, this year. I'm really glad to be working with her. You know, she's been super helpful in, in getting the program going, especially during these challenging times and doing it remotely. So I'm really grateful to her for, for the energy that she's bringing to, to food studies and, and helping me to put it together, especially in these really challenging times. And then I want to introduce also our speakers today. Marcus Langford is the Associate Dean of Students at the Office of the Dean of Students and has been really involved in a lot of different activities supporting students and has taken on this responsibility uh, leading the, the task force here with Dr. Taylor McComb who is the director of the Student Sustainability Center at the U of O and received his PhD here at the U of O too from Environmental Studies. So I think uh, the kind of collaboration between those two and the collaboration between different members of the food studies community, students, staff, faculty, everybody's kind of united around this particular uh, issue and, and theme. And I think uh, I am very grateful for the leadership that these two have played in bringing food, food security and, and food issues, basic needs in, in a way. Uh, to the attention of the administration and working as good good faith uh, actors in that dynamic. And I've really been just really gratified to see the progress that's being made over the last couple of years because it's kind of one of the most important things that we can do. I always tell uh, my students in my big undergrad classes, people have needs of all different kinds. People have needs for tutorials around uh, macroeconomics. People have uh, needs of getting help with, uh, you know, writing, tutoring, or something like that. But some of the most essential needs, unfortunately, have have not necessarily gotten as much attention as they could. So I'm really glad to see all the dynamic things, and I look forward to hearing from these two about uh, the the processes that are unfolding and the activities that are happening around this issue. Grateful for your leadership and grateful for your, your willingness to come and share this with us here in this format. And also I'm very grateful to see all the different people that are in the, in the audience here from student services, from food studies, from all different kinds of walks of life. And I think that's really great. And I think the energy that we bring to this is intellectually important and, and practically important. So welcome everybody. And if it's the first time you're engaging with food studies, I encourage you to come back and see us and be part of uh, other talks that you might be interested in as well. 
Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn turn the floor over or the screen, as it were, I guess, over to our guests, Marcus and Taylor. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you, Stephen. Uh, that was a lovely introduction. And, and we should just say from the outset that um, both Marcus and, and myself arrived at the university in our current positions. Um, in while these conversations were already starting, right? And, and we'll talk a little bit about what that history is, but by no means is this the brainchild or anything like that of Marcus and I. We, we sort of just saw that there was already a path that was being um, forged and we, we decided to, to go down it. Um, yeah. um, so um, yeah, I, I think we'll just go ahead and get into it. And I'll also just echo Stephen's, um, uh, it's really nice to see many of you on here. Uh, one of the things that I miss most dearly about being in person is the kind of like interstitial relationships that you have with people that you don't actually work with. Um, and, and I feel like there's many people in this group as I'm looking at the matrix of faces in yeah. front of me where I don't necessarily work with you all, but I know you and we pass each other in the halls or have held halls. Um, you know, down the street from you or, or down the hall, have offices down the hallway from you or that kind of a thing. So it's really great to, to see everyone. Um, Marcus, you want to say anything by way of getting started or should we just dive in? I think we can just dive in. Cool. Away we go. Uh, so I am sharing my screen and here we are. Um, so Marcus and I were meeting just a little bit before this to talk um, about how we wanted this to go. And I think what we'll do is we'll just kind of blitz through some of this information and leave a lot of time for conversation. So the idea here is that we'll be skipping over some of the details of things, but providing enough to give us place for us to have a conversation about it later. Um, and then uh, and then we'll, we'll move through it. So we want to talk about basically three different parts of, of Hunger on Campus and this initiative that's called Feed the Flock. We want to talk about the, the history of it, um, just to give a little bit of background to it and the structure of what the Food Security Task Force looks like on campus. A little bit about data and definitions because the, um, the, the terminology of food security and food insecurity is sometimes um, squishy at best uh, and, and for good reason. And so we just want to contextualize a little bit what that means and how we understand it as part of the Food Security Task Force. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we spend a, a good chunk of our time letting you all know what resources exist on campus, whether they're for yourself or for students or for peers or for friends or for uh, any anyone else. We want to make sure that we give proper attention to those, those kinds of things. Um, uh, I'll start with this one. Um, so food security at UO, this is kind of the, the generational path that it's, it's on. It, it started with an undergraduate thesis in a lot of ways um, and uh, an ASUO president. So Kiara Kashuba, who was, uh, I believe, in the food, food studies program uh, and the Clark Honors College did her honors thesis on food security on campus. Um, it did it with a couple a, sort of like Facebook methodology, let's call it sort of pure um, peer surveys and, and found uh, some initial data that was pretty alarming and that, that allowed a lot of people to take, um, take a look at what was going on. One of those people was then ASUO president, Amy Shank. Um, so with that, Amy Shank working with um, Dean of Students and uh, Chris Winters at the time, um, pulled together this, hunger, this Oregon Hunger Task Force listening session that was a, a um, iteration of the Oregon legislative's sort of tour of hunger in Oregon. And through there and a student who was working in my office um, at the time, their vision, they said, hey, we need to have one of these listening sessions on campus um, so that legislators and university presidents from all over Oregon can see each other in the room and recognize that this is now a shared commitment, right? That, that, that this knowledge is now known and that we know that you know it and you know that we know that you know it. And so now if you, we do nothing, no good, right? That, um, that prompted President Schill to, to convene the Food Security Task Force and basically said, you all meet and give me an ask. I want to hear an ask at the end of a few um, months of working on, on what you think it's going to take to, to do this, uh, to alleviate the concerns that, um, uh, and the issues of food insecurity that Kiara and others had, had pointed out. That created this initiative that we call Feed the Flock. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that means, but, but generally we refer to Feed the Flock as the kind of 
umbrella program that has underneath it multiple different programs, all of which are addressing food insecurity on campus. Um, the Food Security Task Force, as we'll show here in just a minute, doesn't actually control any of the programs by itself. What the Food Security Task Force does is uh, convenes all of the people who uh, run those programs and provides a listening board and guidance and steering around those programs. Um, and that all of those initiatives, all of those programs together are what we what we refer to as Feed the Flock. Uh, the president um, was moved by the ask that we put forward, which is basically around $100,000 to run five or six different programs for a pilot year. Um, so that was funded in full. Uh, we got everything that we were asking for, basically. Um, and then we ran programs for a year. And at the end of that, our pilot funding was over and we made a request to the budget advisory group as a formal, as a way to get formal recurring funding for all of these various different programs. That was successful. That was funded in full um, in, no, in no small part to the guidance of Jamie Moffat, who was also sits on the, on the, uh, on the task force and who's also sort of, you know, um, uh, for those unfamiliar, Jamie Moffat is the vice president for finance and administration at the university, obviously has a little bit of an ear into what's going to sit well with budgetarily. And so she was able to work with us and we were able to work with her to put together a, a package that we felt like was going to make good use of the very limited extra funds that the, that the budget advisory group had at its disposal. So we put forward a, a version of this um, proposal with data to demonstrate impact and it was funded in full. So now we're funded in perpetuity. Um, and, then, and then as of May of 2020, we kind of did this um, pivot, um, basically looking at COVID and the realities of what that was doing to food security, what that was doing for, for student proximity to resources and then the uh, social justice uprisings that happened as in response to the murder of George Floyd, really took a hard look at the programs that we were offering and asked, can we, can we do better? So we'll talk about all of that um, towards the latter part of this presentation. And I'll just real quickly touch on the, the structure of the food security task force and how it looks. So you can see from this org chart um, that this is a, a very broad coalition drawing on a number of different people at a number of different levels, both internal to the university and external. So we have students, we have program directors and administrators, we have faculty, um, and we have community partners, people who are not affiliated with the University of Oregon. The vision and mission of the university's food security task force is to ensure that all students have access to culturally appropriate, healthy, nutritious food. And uh, you'll note there in the asterisks that any one of those groups, right? So um, uh, the Student Sustainability Center in Student Life or the Dean of Students Office in Student Life or advising or financial aid or um, even dining and housing, any one of those groups can have their own food security program or initiative, right? That they run. And then they bring that back to the task force and sit on the task force and everyone in the task force uh, looks at those programs, keeps each other up to date and makes changes and tries to do the strategic planning around the direction of those programs. But the programs themselves are run um, departmentally or at the unit level, not at this kind of large task force level. Yeah, so I, I can talk a little bit about uh, some data and definitions. Uh, and so when we talk about food security, uh, you know, we're, we're really talking about the lack of reliable access uh, to sufficient quantities of affordable, nutritious, uh, affordable and nutritious food. And one of the things that, you know, we found that has been a large part of our work uh, is trying to normalize, uh, one, a conversation around uh, food insecurity, but then also trying to normalize, or I should say, help divorce folks of this notion uh, that, you know, these types of things shouldn't be expected. Uh, and, and so oftentimes, you know, we, we find ourselves talking about, uh, you know, again, this notion of, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, even my experience in college or even some of the students that we're working with right now, you know, there's this kind of underlying current of, well, you know, I'm a college student and part of being, you know, a college student is having to survive off of, you know, ramen and leftover pizza and those types of things. And uh, what we found is because so many people find that that or believe that that is kind of an expectation or how things are, uh, that many folks are just okay with that. And, uh, you know, that really is not and should not 
be the case. Uh, you know, we as an institution and uh, you know, as as a society, uh, should be able to provide uh, support. Uh, you know, for students to to ensure that they have access uh, to adequate food. And so, I I think that's a, a really big thing that we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, talking about. Again, you know, how can we normalize this notion of uh, encouraging people to take advantage of some of the opportunities and resources uh, that are available to them? You know, I I, I liken it to uh, you know, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, talking to students about who may be experiencing academic difficulty. And, and one of the things that I found is it's, it's not because uh, most students don't find themselves in academic difficulty because they aren't smart enough, they aren't capable, they can't do the work. Uh, they're just reluctant to ask for help. Uh, and it, it, it's similar, you know, so we have students you know, who are struggling or who may be experiencing a period of difficulty. And there are, are people, places, things, resources that are available to help them. But, uh, you know, for whatever reason, there's a reluctance uh, for them to ask for help. And so uh, that is, uh, uh, again, a part of, you know, some of the work that we've done. So when we think about, uh, you know, food insecurity, uh, this is a very present uh, problem here at uh, the institution. Uh, and, and so at, at the University of Oregon, uh, a couple of years ago, we participated in uh, a, a project um, from, uh, oh, what's the name of it, Taylor, the Hope? Um, yeah, Hope Lab. Hope Lab, Hope Lab, uh, where they do uh, surveys uh, for students to help them identify uh, issues around food insecurity on campus. And so we participated in that survey uh, and we found uh, that at the time of the survey, uh, that there were 36% 36, 36 of uh, UO respondents uh, had experienced food insecurity in the last uh, 30 days, uh, and 20 have the lowest level of food security, which means uh, that they were actually experiencing physical, uh, the physical sensation of hunger. Uh, we also found uh, from that study that about 40% of uh, the students who completed it worried about running out of food before having money to buy for, uh, and that 40% could not afford to eat balanced meals. And again, that goes back to this notion that I've mentioned around just kind of having this expectation that, you know, that's the way that things are. Uh, as we dug a little bit more uh, deeper, I should say, into um, some of the assessment data, we found that uh, this was absolutely an intersectional problem. And so what we found is, uh, that some of our students who, uh, who are from historically marginalized identities or populations, um, you know, in other scenarios uh, that when it comes to food insecurity and housing insecurity, uh, that problem translated. Uh, and so again, if you, I won't go through all of this, uh, but you know, if you again, look at, you know, our students who might be transgender or identify as gay and lesbian or bisexual or even uh, black and African-American, you can find that uh, both here at UO, um, that uh, the number of students who identified as uh, housing and food secure in those populations is higher uh, when you look at the number compared to uh, white students, both nationally and uh, here at the University of Oregon. And so that's part of the reason why, again, as Taylor mentioned, once some of the things started happening, you know, with the murder of George Floyd and some of the other things, we as a committee started to ask ourselves, can we be more responsive uh, to students who clearly need uh, us to, to uh, put them at the center of you know, what we're doing and, and how we're thinking? Uh, yeah, and I think you know part of I think part of what's what's shocking about I'll just talk on this before the next right. It's like you know, Stephen, you and kicking us off. You sort of mentioned uh, you know around these kinds of like common experiences that we have at the university and the things that we do to you know uh, to gather and, and meet and and to to um, to think about the places where our students are and what they experience. And and one of the ways that we like to think about this or talk about it is to sort of think about like if there was any one thing on campus. Um, that unified or united 36% of our students, there would be a robust program to meet that, right? And, and so we're not just, right? So if 36% of our students were struggling with statistics and needed statistics tuition or, um, you know, tutoring, we can guarantee that there would be a robust statistics tutoring thing, right? If 36% if of our students were struggling to meet uh, the, you know, um, 
uh, writing requirement. There would be a robust program to ensure that students were meeting the writing requirement. And so what we're experiencing is that we have 36% of our students struggling to meet basic needs around food security, right? And, and so part of the work that we're trying to do is ensure that there is a robust programming environment to meet that huge population of our students. Um, to give you a little bit of a sense of like what this looks like in terms of, um, of what students do who experience food insecurity, um, we're talking about students who are skipping meals, who are deciding not to eat, who aren't eating for the whole day. Um, and then if we think about the, the actual impacts, right, if we think about this not just as a social justice issue, which it certainly is, but if we think about this as an academic issue, right? If we think about the academic mission of the university and the way that food insecurity impedes the academic mission of the university, we know nationally, we don't have this data for specific for UO, but we know nationally um, that 50% you know, up north of 50% of students who are experiencing food insecurity miss a class. More than 50% don't join extracurriculars. More than 50% don't buy mandatory um, books. And 80% of those students say that they are not performing as well as they otherwise could, right? Um, and I want to stop a little and, and, and draw attention to that not joining an extracurricular activity, because this is one of those places, like Marcus was saying before, where we, we see food insecurity happening and affecting students in ways that, that aren't necessarily obvious. Um, and the extracurricular activity is a huge one, uh, in part, um, and because both Marcus and I are coming from a student life um, you know, division, uh, we think about these notions of belonging all of the time and the conversations around belonging and acceptance and what that means for uh, graduation rates. So we know that when students feel a sense of connection and a feel a sense of belonging, they are far more likely to graduate. And we also know that when students are feeling food insecure, they have a very hard time connecting and feeling a sense of belonging. The easiest way to think about this is to think about that group project that we all love so much um, and how many times that group project happens at a coffee shop or happens at a coffee shop or happen, you know, let's grab a pizza afterwards or, hey, let's go get a burrito and talk about the assignment. A student who's experiencing food insecurity is going to self-select out of those experiences, which is going to leave them then isolated and not, not able to feel that sense of belonging and inclusion. Um, so this is what we put together. So this is the Feed the Flock initiative as it stood uh, at the beginning of last year. And we'll talk a little bit about how this has shifted as a result of both uh, the social justice um, uh, uprising and COVID. But we put together uh, um, seven different programs and those programs are designed to meet students in various different ways. So we can think about on one axis, we can think about um, the length of time that it kit gets to get benefits, right? To, to get resources. So you can have it, something happens very immediately or something happens uh, in, a, in a while, a couple months. And then you can also think about the um, ease with which that is acceptable, right? The ease with which uh, you can get those, right? So something can be very, very easy to be a part of or something can be very, very hard to be a part of. And what we've tried to do with these programs is design them in a way that we have a scatter shot on that matrix so that there are points all over it. We have easy programs that are long lasting and we have difficult programs that are long lasting and difficult programs to get into that are, uh, you know, uh, immediate and also, you know, so, so all over those places. Um, and part of the way that we tried to structure these programs is to is to provide a kind of on ramping into con, into increasingly beneficial and impactful programming uh, or services right so the first example is uh, produce drops which are like we call them free pop up markets um, that happen in the EMU amphitheater um, and that's in a, in in, in uh, partnership with Food for Lane County. Um, it's, it's every Tuesday from three to five in the EMU amphitheater, or there's a giant tent now on the EMU lawn behind the EMU, and that's where we've been holding them in poor weather. Um, that is a very convivial atmosphere. It does not look like anything other than a bunch of students giving away vegetables. Um, and the purpose of that is to be this low barrier to entry to destigmatize the accessing of resources, as Marcus was saying. The idea of being a student can uh, feel comfortable being visible in that space and then build their comfort in accessing other kinds of resources as well that may feel far more institutional or far more programmatic. Uh, ducks Feeding Ducks is an emergency meal system. It's anonymous, so there's no visibility. It's a very, very, very low bar to entry. 
um, but it has a short impact time. It's one meal. It's $10 onto a student's duck bucks account uh, for an immediate meal. And, and, it, and a student can access that twice per term. Um, on the other end of that spectrum is SNAP enrollment, right? SNAP is a supplemental nutrition assistance program, sometimes called Oregon Trail, sometimes called food stamps, sometimes called EBT. Um, that is a very uh, long lasting program and that it provides monthly benefits, but it is a federal program that requires an interview with state uh, you know, officials. And so it's, it's harder to get a student to sit down and be like, you know, excited about going into a government office and holding a, an interview with an official that they're going to look at your finances. Um, but students in Oregon are highly eligible for this as a result of the way that the Oregon legislature understands the SNAP requirements on a national level. So SNAP's a national program, but it gets it gets uh, um, it adjudicated on the on the state level, and the state has actually said has made some some pretty. Um, progressive and uh, you know small p progressive and small l liberal choices in how and in, in how students qualify uh, which is leaves Oregon students the state of Oregon students much better off um, uh, Marcus you want to talk about the other ones sure yeah so uh, picking up uh, we have the student food pantry and this is actually a partnership uh, in which uh, we work with Episcopal Campus Ministries. And so uh, they, as an outside entity, going back to what Taylor mentioned, uh, how we work with outside entities, uh, they actually run the food, student food pantry uh, and uh, we partner and support them. Uh, and this is open uh, to students twice a week. Uh, so Wednesdays and Thursdays from four to six. Uh, and again, this is a, a relatively uh, low level. So they just check student IDs and more students have IDs. Uh, they're able to uh, proceed through the pantry. Uh, I will say that uh, we are pretty excited about this uh, for a couple of reasons. One is they actually were able to move to a larger uh, location uh, this past summer. Uh, and so that means uh, that, um, you know, once everything again, quote unquote, gets back to normal, that they'll be able to see a higher number of students. Uh, we also are looking to explore the possibility of being able to expand uh, the hours. And so we recognize that, you know, Wednesday and Thursday, while two days are great, uh, you know, if we could do more days during the week and offer even potentially weekend options, uh, that would be um, something that would be preferable as well. So that's actually a conversation that we are uh, in the process of trying to work through. Uh, we actually are, uh, have hired uh, a student uh, who's going to be an intern and uh, they're going to be a group of folks who kind of help manage uh, volunteers and again look to grow that program. Uh, leftover text over uh, is a text messaging system uh, that again when we were in person uh, so if there was an event that was happening on campus and there was going to be a surplus of food uh, students have the ability to sign up for leftover text over uh, and uh, they would actually get a message uh, an email message uh, a text message, I'm sorry, uh, indicating that there was going to be uh, food and it would actually, the message would include a campus map so they would know uh, where to go. Uh, before uh, things happened with, co with COVID and uh, there were a lot of events on campus, uh, we found that that was a really, really strong program. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to uh, the opportunity for us to get back on campus so we can pick that up. Um, again, uh, we found that as more and more departments and folks who are having programs and events were find, finding out about that, uh, they were being um, uh, very much so willing to participate in uh, that program. Uh, cooking classes uh, is uh, something that we've done uh, as well. And so uh, the Duck's Nest, uh, which is in the uh, EMU, uh, has led uh, cooking classes on preparing staples and uh, they've actually focused on helping students to uh, identify, to use uh, the things that they get from uh, the pantry, uh, the food pantry and produce drops. Uh, and so again, it's not necessarily just about, uh, you know, cooking some, something, but it's helping students understand, uh, you know, how do they make a real and nutritious meal from the food uh, that they have. Uh, and then the, the last thing uh, that I'll just touch on briefly is something called Hearth to Table. Uh, and so this is another one of our um, external partners. Uh, so Central Lutheran Church uh, every Tuesday offers a free meal and cooking class 
uh, to, to students. And uh, even within everything that's going on with COVID, uh, they're still working on adapting this to that environment. And so they are periodically releasing, uh, you know, cooking uh, demonstrations on social media, and they're preparing boxes for students to pick up uh, as well. And so we'll talk about this in a second, but, you know, yes, even recognizing that we are in challenging times um, with the pandemic, we're still trying to be responsive to the needs because we know uh, that these needs for students have not gone away. Yeah, so to that point, uh, basically what happened in, in, in and around May when it looked, when it became apparent that, um, uh, we were living in a new reality, right? That COVID wasn't going away. Uh, I, I I like to think about it that, that moment where you started seeing commercials advertising contactless services, where you're like, ah, so we're here now. Um, so around then, when we realized we can't just put things on pause, we actually have to change them. And around that time, when there was a a long overdue and um, once again, uh, attention being paid to human equity and social justice. Um, we took a look at what was happening in May. Um, and as Marcus said, there was, the, there was this also this somewhat for, well, fortuitous event in that the pantry, um, part of what we were gonna do is, as part of the original program was just give pantry, the student food pantry, which is run by the Episcopal Church, um, money. And we were just gonna say, hey, we're gonna pay for your rent for a bigger space. In the process of trying to find that space, someone donated it. Central uh, uh, Grace Lutheran Church said, "We've got a we've got a, a, a Sunday school that we don't actually use. Uh, it's very close to campus. Um, you know, basically 19th and Hilliard. Uh, just use that instead." And then that left us with a really significant chunk of change that we could then switch and pivot and use that money for other things specifically these questions, right? How are we, how are we making sure that students under COVID uh, and then how, what are we doing for our BIPOC students and making sure that those students, as we saw who are experiencing this the most are, are um, seeing these services, right? In, in ways that they need to. Uh, so the picture that we have here is actually a picture of the, uh, of the pop-up pantry that's over at the Many Nations Longhouse. Um, and we'll talk about that, but basically what we were able to do is just sort of say, look, there's, there are groups and, and spaces on campus that are already doing this work. Now, if we just give them money that allows them to continue to program in other ways as well. So that's one of the things we did. And so we were able to, to get the, um, the Many Nations Longhouse uh, just money to, to supplement their pantry. Um, so this is a sort of like what it was and what it is now as a result of COVID. I won't, I won't run through the whole thing here, um, but basically what we realized is, um, you know, our first initial thinking was when campus shut down in, in March and then everyone would scatter. Um, but what we realized is that a lot of our students who are the most food insecure are the least mobile, right? Either because they've got families or they've got uh, their international students, uh, their non-traditional students. They are students who are, um, you know, do not have um, parents. They don't have another home to go to, right? That, that Eugene is their home. The dorms are their home. Um, there is no a way to go back to when campus closed. So we couldn't just shut down everything locally and focus only on what was happening remotely. At the same time, we had a big exodus of students who left and they were going into places where they were living off campus. They weren't living close. They weren't defraying costs with roommates anymore, those kinds of things. And they were maybe entering a situation where they would be uh, food insecure from afar. So we did a number of different things to try to uh, uh, meet those um, uh, meet those changes. And then we were also able to take that money that was being used for the uh, pantry and be able to increase and up some of the program that we did. So rather than it happening every second and fourth Tuesday, produce drops now happen every week. Um, we were able, as Marcus said, to hire a student who is helping coordinate volunteers over at the pantry to make sure that they have consistent, reliable coverage and that it's not just kind of seat of the pants all of the time. Uh, for SNAP enrollment stuff, we, we moved online. We had students producing videos, holding Zoom office hours for enrollment. We've built a um, online chat feature that's gonna be rolling out pretty soon where students can just chat with a, someone, a SNAP advisor. Um, and we were able to increase the, the amount of times that people could access ducks feeding ducks. Um, we were 
you know, a benefit of the pandemic is that when you're broadcasting or, or tuning in from home, there's no limit to space. So Hearth to Table and Duck Nest kind of paired together and said, let's offer, you know, meal kits and cook-alongs instead of 10 people coming to a class to learn how to cook. We can broadcast this to hundreds of people and you can come pick up a meal kit from Hearth to Table rather than pick up a, a, a prepared food. You'll go home, tune in, and we'll all cook the things together. Yeah, so um, as Taylor mentioned earlier, you know, part of what we had conversations about is recognizing, you know, this is where we started. Uh, we also know that we needed to uh, continue to find ways to grow and adapt. And part of that is thinking about how we can better and more integrate students into what we're doing, but then also how can we expand uh, the level of, of, of service that we're providing uh, to, again, some of our students from historically marginalized identities uh, that may be uh, you know, kind of existing on the margins a bit. Uh, and so there are uh, a, a number of ways in which we have tried to do uh, just those two things. And so uh, some of the new programs uh, that we have uh, initially, uh, that we've launched, and actually Taylor and I was just talking a minute ago, and we were just saying that, you know, as we looked at this and put this in a table, even within the context of what's going on, uh, you know, with COVID, the COVID and the pandemic and how we've all been impacted by that, we were just saying that, you know, we're, we're pretty proud of the fact that, you know, we've been able to, uh, you know, kind of launch, uh, you know, some of these, these new initiatives. Um, but first and foremost, um, with some of that money that we were able to reallocate, uh, we were able to provide some additional funding uh, to some particular affinity spaces across campus. And so uh, we identified some money that was able to help us uh, help the Black Cultural Center and uh, the Longhouse uh, by, again, providing funding for some of the food security work that they're doing for uh, their particular populations. Uh, it's actually, actually not listed but we've been working with um, uh, the coordinator for uh, non-traditional and veterans affairs uh, to support uh, some additional support for veteran students uh, as well. And so, again, that's another population that we've been uh, trying to outreach to. Uh, in terms of uh, integrating students, um, you know, one of the things that we are looking to do is to have a student representative uh, receive a stipend for serving on uh, the steering committee. Uh, we actually are looking for a student to do this. And so if you're interested, uh, you know, let us know. Um, and either Taylor and I are, are grab it and we can put the uh, information or the application in the chat. Um, I, th I think it's done, yeah. Uh, so one of us will do that. Uh, but one of the reasons why we were pretty adamant about um, making this a stipended position is because while we wanted to have um, you know a student be involved uh, we wanted to actually pay them for uh, be able to compensate them for their time energy effort uh, and label uh, and so you know even i can think back to you know my experience as an undergraduate student i, I think oftentimes as you know faculty staff and administrators we see these opportunities that we're giving to students as uh, just that opportunities, and they are. Uh, and you know, while we ask students to sit on committees and to serve on things, and it it is a oftentimes a good opportunity for them. But I think also sometimes we can forget, uh, you know, that we are um, asking and in some cases requiring and demanding uh, time, energy, effort, and quite frankly, labor, uh, you know, for them. And so this was our way of uh, you know, trying to be mindful of and responsive to uh, that. Uh, Taylor touched on this, uh, but we have uh, you know, food security assistants. Uh, and, and so these are folks who are uh, someone who's working with the pantry um, and also the food security uh, ambassador programs. And so these, these ambassador programs are about finding students to kind of help us get the word out. I, I think one of the things that we found uh, you know, as uh, a, a challenge. And so the benefit is uh, the benefit of, uh, you know, kind of uh, these programs uh, existing in pods is that, you know, we have a lot of different ways to kind of support uh, and provide services and resources to students. But one of the things that we found is because some of them are decentralized, it can be difficult to help students stay aware of uh, and abreast of what's going on and what's all out there. And so one of the ways that we sought to try to mitigate that uh, is to try to hire uh, some uh, students who would actually serve as ambassadors. And so, uh, you know, they'll provide 
um, SNAP support, uh, but then they also can do outreach as well. And so, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, students uh, have the ability to connect with other students and then students see one uh, each other as more credible. And so uh, for us, again, a way of getting the word out out was to try to find uh, and recruit uh, some ambassadors who could assist uh, with that. Uh, Taylor, do you want to hit the, the last three? Sure. Uh, also, just give a special shout out to Ellen. Ellen is one of our food security leaders uh, who is yep. doing all of the SNAP work and all that. She's fantastic and good to see you. Um, so the uh, emerging grant program. So this is something that we're cooking up right now and just finished up. But uh, one of the things we were able to do is just take a significant chunk of that uh, of that dollar savings, $5,000 and say, we don't have all of the answers. So let's give that to, to projects, right? Um, so we wanted to give space for an idea to develop that could be funded on the sort of like mini startup level. So we'll fund a, a project, multiple projects every quarter at around two to $3,000 for startup costs um, to address a new, to, to start a new program to address food insecurity on campus. Um, the only stipulation to that is that there has to be a student as part of the applicant team, but faculty members, administrators, uh, officers of administrators, classified staff, anyone is, is welcome to apply and to submit their program idea, but there has to be a student involved with the program um, in some way. ASUO is working with um, folks over in dining and housing to develop a, a swipe drive. This is a program that exists on a lot of different campuses, um, but basically, uh, you know, there are unused meal points at the end of the year. And the idea is rather than letting those unused meal points get converted into uh, dollars that get donated to Food for Lane County, which is what it's happening right now. Let's take those unused meal points and give them to students who are looking for meals. Um, and so ASUO is working on that and then we'll probably start next quarter. Um, housing and Dining has been a great partner in this. They just very kindly and very sensibly requested, please let us figure out fall quarter before we do something new with winter quarter because they're they've, you know, they've been hit really hard with all of the changes too. Um, and then the last thing that we'll say is that the um, the food security task force and, and steering committee has been meeting with uh, the division of student life's assessment team to develop strategic goals and assessment mechanisms. So we hold these meetings every couple of weeks offline from the larger groups and are just trying to think about what are the metrics that we can put in place to ensure that we're meeting the goals that we have, right? To ensure that we're meeting this vision of removing food insecurity as a barrier to graduation and ensuring that all students have access to culturally appropriate, healthy, and nutritious food. Mm -hmm. um, we'll stop there. That's a lot of us talking. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, you know, we can give more detail about this stuff. Here is uh, our contact information. Uh, is that right, Marcus? Do you not have a D at the end of yours? Or is that a typo? No, it's right. I actually don't have the D. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, and then the, the Student Sustainability Center's food security team, uh, which is a couple of the students we mentioned is food security at UOR too. Bravo, great presentation. And it's amazing to see all of this stuff kind of together in a package in this presentation. Just makes, makes me really, really proud to know that people are working so hard on these things. And that was one of the initial pieces is like, this is happening, this is happening, but like coordination of it and keeping it going and building it out, just super gratifying to see that. And that's all I'm gonna say. And then other people can chime in, just really grateful for your leadership. Like I said at the beginning, I'm even more so now that I've seen the presentation and understand it, really important. People can uh, raise their hands, I guess, and we can try to field some questions for you, for you guys or comments. And I'll just mention really quickly, uh, I also dropped two links uh, in the blog. Uh, and so one is uh, a basic needs uh, blog that's updated with a variety of information uh, as well as uh, a food section that's off the Dean of Students website. So I just want to make sure that folks um, knew to look there. Hi, can I <laughs> talk? Thank you so much for this. This is awesome. So I've been, uh, I teach writing um, and 
I work with environmental justice stuff too, but my students, this term specifically, I'm not sure what it is, um, but they've been really fired up on getting involved with food security. Um, and I invited them to the presentation, but I know <laughs> um, how they are. And I reminded them again today, um, but I'm just going, this is gonna be so great for them, whether they're doing it for their research project or for practical reasons. And I have a few students who actually started like food security initiatives on their high school campuses. And so looking at those grants, I mean, they have ideas because I showed them a little video about what other schools are doing and asked them if they had ideas and they have some great ideas. And so I'm not sure Taylor, if anybody has reached out to you from my class, I know Kerrigan, I gave her your information because she was like really interested. Um, but yeah, if we could have, what, so is this PowerPoint, will it be available on that blog that or those links you gave us or can I have it and do I have permission then to, to post it to my Canvas site so they can look over it and I can refer to it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the, I don't think we'll put the PowerPoint up on the website, but but totally we'll send it to you, no problem. Yeah, and Kerrigan did reach out and and she connected with a couple of I, I think the students, um, Sophia and Lindsay from our office, who are the food security coordinators, um, and 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 yeah, I mean, you know, having taught one twenty three before, right? Like, it, it's always like that nugget of being able to say like what you're producing can have like a practical impact in the world. And like, yeah, we have money. Like we have money that we would like to give to students to do these things. So, so please send them our way. Awesome. Thank you so much for this. This is, this is great. Yeah. And I'll just say that we were recording the, the Zoom session too. And there are a bunch of people who were really interested, students, faculty, staff, everybody that were really excited, but obviously, you know, for different reasons can't attend. So we have the Zoom and we'll put that up on our on our food studies uh, page too. And I did drop in the food studies uh, address. And, uh, you know, all these students that we're talking about, the, the students who are involved and interested in, in these issues, we really want to make sure that they're aware that there's a minor in food studies. So that they can do these things, have an impact on, on their own lives, the lives of other students, and also can, can gain academic credit for it and put it in a kind of an intellectual kind of framework as well. So everybody that's working with students, you know, steer them our way because we want that program to be engaged like this. It's not, you know, a program that's supposed to just be in your head. It's supposed to be in your stomach and in your hands and, and things too. So make sure that we we get that word out as well. Yeah, the other, the other thing I'll add to that is I think one of the pieces that that we talk about a lot in the task force, um, where perhaps the the offerings from the university are not as robust as they could be, is research. Right? Um, mm -hmm. It would be great to be able to support uh, faculty and graduate student research and undergraduate student as well research around issues of food security that were like hyper local right thinking about the impacts on these kinds of programs on our campus that kind of a thing right yeah. thinking about what and, and we just, um you know for whatever reason right I, I i guess because the the practicality of students being hungry took took precedent over trying to figure out a, a research design portfolio um but we just haven't gotten there yet and but we know that it's something that needs to be done um so that's a great point. That's a great point, Taylor. And, you know, I do this fig for food matters for the first year students. And I always have Kiara come to talk about mm -hmm. the idea of like uh, research and research's connection as an undergrad, research's connection to impact. It's like one of the great, really great examples of, of like you started out that slide early on with her. Yeah. And that inter intervention that she did and all these things, I invited her to the presentation today, but she's working in the Columbia Gorge in food security. So yeah. she's like a really dedicated person, you know, working on that and, and doing, doing it. So it's actually important for society, but it's also important for student success if they want to work in the field too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Other folks have comments or questions? Lots yeah, of good I, I they see in the, in the chat. I just wanted to, uh, because I'm maybe coming from a different environment, but I was just wondering if all of this that you do is just like the initiative of people at the University of Oregon. There's no like, um, like state mandated or state funded stuff for, uh, I don't know, uh, subsidized lunches and uh, no, 
Uh, no, not at not at the college level. So so one of the things that we often talk about in college food insecurity is that we offer wraparound wraparound services or support for students through K-12, right? And you can take that same student who for all intents and purposes would still qualify for those things, but as soon as they leave high school, they're somehow kicked out of the social services oh, now. Okay. Um, so there is no state mandated or any kind of support network or anything like that at the college level, which is kind of the reason, uh, well, undoubtedly the reason why so many colleges are late to recognize and, and, and meet this need. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, do you also have this for employees? Maybe, maybe not for faculty, but at least in Slovakia also like employees ha um, are entitled to subsidize lunches and so on because many of the employees who work not as faculty, but as other jobs at the university, their kind of salaries um, are often like not the average salary or less than average. And uh, mm -hmm. so they are entitled to these like uh, food assistance. Yeah, short answer is kind of, um, so like subsidy, no, but uh, mm -hmm. certainly there are food security programs that exist for anyone, right? So um, the Food for Lane County is the big player in mm -hmm. our area. They're based out of Eugene and they serve all of Lane County and they're the extension of Oregon Food Bank that's that's local to us. Um, and they provide tons of different programs and services for anyone who qualifies. But as far as it being specifically tied to the university and offering a kind of like university or subsidy program through those mechanisms, no. Um, and it's, you know, one of, we oftentimes hear, uh, are there, is a story that I often tell, which is that there was a student who was actually from a European country as well, who was sort of accustomed to a European model of higher education and then came to campus and said, well, like, where's the soup? Like, where's the cantina, right? Like, where's the yeah. cantina where I can go and get like the $2 bowl of soup? And we're just like, well, we've got sushi, like in this, you know, like it's a completely different model of the type of student that we're serving. Um, but one of the things that Hope Lab has really tried to demonstrate is what they call hashtag real college, which is that the, the traditional student is no longer that 18 to 24 year old student that so many folks in the United States think about as being the, the typical college student. The typical college student now is a non-traditional student, someone who is not 18 to 24, coming back to school, having children, having a family, having a job, working, you know, all of those various different things. But the infrastructure of this of the university system has not has not caught up to that or reflect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I had a quick question about services during winter break and summer. Mm -hmm. I have experienced food insecurity, and over winter break was one of the hardest times because the food pantry wasn't open over winter break. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what you're doing to address those time periods. Yeah, it, that is certainly the hardest, thing. and the reason for that is that the, uh, all of, most of these programs are volunteer run and the volunteers disappear. Um, and so, um, so pantry and produce drops don't operate. You're, you're right about that. So the other systems do. Now the, the rest of Food for Lane County's operations, right? The, the community pantries and those kinds of things still exist. And if you look at that basic needs blog that Mark has dropped in the chat, we link out to all of those various different resources that, that are not tied to the university calendar. But this is definitely one of the biggest problems with college food security programming is that it's tied to an academic calendar, which doesn't make a lot of sense, right? That, that um, you know, uh, for any number of, of reasons and and breaks are, are just one of many um right that even the, like another one that we talk about all the time that if we had the magic wand to save to fix would be the the fact that student employees or that all of us uh who are work for the university only get paid once a month and that student who come and if we start in october right and or, or late september students don't have the opportunity to work a student job until and get paid until the end of october but they got to pay two months of rent they got to pay for books they got to enroll they got to pay tuition and they got to do all of that before they ever get a paycheck for their student job um and it's again just this example of it not aligning in the way that it should um so point taken, valid critique. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to staff up those things during winter or, or um, uh, academic breaks. Uh, the pantry does run through summer, though, just not winter break. Hey, my name is 
it's Amy, I'm a staff member and not really interacting with students all that much, but this kind of uh, what you said just actually brought up my point. I was wondering what staff members can do who aren't necessarily affiliated with student network when finance and administration shared services, what we can do to help with the food security initiatives. Hmm. And, um, you know, possibly having something where staff members can volunteer for those gaps where students aren't necessarily available. I didn't know these programs existed until today. And, you know, the information may be getting out through the academic portion of campus, but through the standard staff, it may not be getting out. And that might be a target audience you could look at. So yeah. That- yeah. I th- Yes. <laughs> um, you know, again, I think it's it, sometimes it's, I don't know whether it's helpful or not to just sort of think about the history of how these programs manifest, right? Um, and that they are, as, as Stephen mentioned, there was this sort of like, you know, constellation of programs, right? Where there's like, there's a pantry and architecture and someone over here holds, you know, free lunches every Tuesday and someone, over, and then so like the first the first task was pulling all that together. Um, So there's a lot of, there were a lot of carts lined up before there were horses. Um, And this is one of them, right? Like, I I think that you're right in that we don't necessarily have a a robust mechanism for interfacing with with faculty and staff who wanna get involved. Um, That said, um, uh, it is easy to volunteer at the student food pantry. um, And and if you email the the folks at food security, Food security at uoregon.edu. They're the folks who are trying to, to figure out and help this the pantry. Um, we can go a little bit into the weeds too around like the history of volunteering at that, and it gets a little wonky in terms of who is doing what and when and where. Suffice it to say, at the current moment, we're trying to we're trying to be more involved in their volunteering and staffing than we have been in the past. And this is a fantastic point and one that is that is well taken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one, I mean, definitely knowing of this, I can help push it out to other people as well and help them understand that there is a volunteer opportunity for that because yeah. I know a lot of people, it, it's hard to be hungry and they know what that feels like and they're definitely willing to volunteer in, in yeah. situations like that. And um, I know that we're over the time, but also do you ever do talks for other groups on campus? I'm part of the diversity committee and I'm wondering if I could contact you at some point um, to maybe do a talk for one of the monthly groups that we have, because this is a really interesting topic. Yeah, by all, by all means. Yeah, and part of the way that we do, I mean, we, um, as you mentioned before, a lot of the trainings and a lot of the talks that we do are for student facing staff. Mm-hmm. So uh, for the like, SNAP in particular, we have a, a group of students who work with trainers and who work with advisors and try to get training and all of those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, got disrupted this year as a result of COVID and not being able to pull 15 people and that kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, again, point well taken. Can I jump in there? And I wanted to just uh, say that I think this is this is a really good kind of story for around the O, you know, especially the staff around the O, that question, just to get this whole thing, visibility, yeah. so that people who are in, in spots that may not be students or faculty or student services, but are still interested in understanding what's going on, the issues and challenges, but yeah. also really, really important programming that's yeah. available. So I think maybe find, you know, some way we can all kind of think about getting some, somebody from the, around the O. Yeah. Pick up the story and push it out a little bit and get it some visibility would be great. Yeah. That's yeah. great. And, you know, I think Marcus and I will be the first to admit that the, the outreach and engagement portion yeah. is, is, has been the toughest for us, right? It's been sort of building the programs and. Yeah. Uh, that makes yeah. sense. I mean, that's the most important thing. That's the front edge. But now that, that this impressive work is going on, shining a light on it so that people can understand and maybe even that comment that said, you know, maybe there's a staff that would like to volunteer in those gaps to try to help. That's great. It, it's, it's more of that outreach piece. And, and uh, I think we can all help with that. You know, and I was thinking of faculty too. Same kind of thing, like a, even a couple of uh, linkages that we've tried to do with the, the union and stuff like just to get those sensibilities out there and what's going on. Yeah. And I know we, we are over time and I know a, a lot of folks had to go back to, to work to do the things that they were doing, but I wanna just recognize the you know really substantial and really important and consequential uh, work that you're doing and the groups that you're working with. I love seeing the diversity, the networking that you're doing is super, super important. The longhouse stuff really, made an impression on me, all of it really, but the networking, 
right? Everybody cares. Everybody cares and everybody is needy in some moment, right? So I think that's super important and, it's, and it spreads around. And, and I'm super grateful for, for your coordination and leadership, like I said at the outset. And let's just, you know, shine some more light on it as much as we can to keep the funding in place and then also to reach more people with the message, really, even, you know, you're going to reach people with the food, that's great, and they need it. But people learning about the initiative is really important, and the issues, too, is really important. So thank yeah, you awesome. very much for, for the work you're doing, for the presentation to us today. And uh, let's let's stay in touch and, and yeah. keep feeding each other, right? Keep supporting yeah. each other. Absolutely. Bravo Absolutely. to you guys and all the teams and the students us. that are working hard to do it, too. And, and uh there isn't anything more important, you know, right?